This is Jim Hughes with AFIO Now. We are a program of recorded interviews, primarily with uh, former U.S. intelligence officers, but occasionally we have a real delight to interview somebody who's active duty with um, the intelligence community. And today is one of those days. Our guest is David Robarge. He is currently the CIA historian. He started in the agency in 1989 as a Middle East analyst, moved to the um, history staff in uh, 1996, and became chief in 2005. David appeared in one of our earlier programs. We gave a, a great presentation on counterintelligence. And today he's going to talk to us about covert action. David, welcome back to AFIO Now. Thank you, Jim. Uh, great pleasure to be here and to talk about a subject of current interest because we're dealing with a new administration and every new administration looks back on its <clears throat> predecessor's covert actions and decides whether to continue some, cancel some, or add some. And what would be extremely valuable at that juncture would be to look back at the history of covert action and try to determine what were good ones, not so good ones, and why, which will be the principal theme of my discussion with you uh, this morning. So let me bring up my slideshow and we will get started. Covert action is a very interesting subject for a historian because it takes us out of the ambit of the immediate core mission areas of an intelligence service or the Central Intelligence Agency, which are collection and analysis. And those are used, of course, to inform policy decisions. Covert action is unique in that it is the only major functional area of the CIA in which we help implement policy. And therein lies both its indispensability and its controversiality. The fact that all presidents, regardless of party, ideology, worldview, eventually get around to using covert action if they don't start immediately upon taking the oath of office, or their policies that covert action helps implement are not, or hopefully are, well thought out, strategically designed, and given time to work. And that leads us to the inevitable situation of covert action failure, uh, of which the agency's history is regrettably littered. Also, numerous successes along the way. I'll be discussing with you this morning some general themes about covert action and then getting into a series of case studies that will exemplify those major themes. Let's start with the basic definition, though. And here I want to go beyond the legalese here. But even there, you see that you get to the basic point of covert action. It's a two-part concept, covert and action. It is an activity or a series of activities designed to affect change in a target environment. But who is the actor of that change is not to be apparent or acknowledged. We want to do things and the effects of what we are doing are known obviously. Suddenly you have a political party that can do things it didn't do before and insurgency is now vibrant. Propaganda messages are being disseminated. Somebody's doing something and those are obviously detectable. And that's the whole point of covert action is to affect change. However, who's behind all of this activity is what's secret. This is another difference between espionage and covert action. Espionage is intended to be secret through and through. You don't want a target government to know that you have recruited an asset or getting secrets from that asset and then doing something about them. Indeed, as you're all well aware, sometimes an asset is so sensitive you can't take action on the intelligence gained from them. But the point is, it's secret through and through. In covert action, the only thing that's secret is the fact that the U.S. is behind it or working in conjunction, as we often do, with a friendly service. So keep that in mind. Uh, covert action is not entirely secret, only part of it. And it is, in effect, something that is supposed to make the world or a target area different than it was before. 
We generally categorize covert action into these general areas. Propaganda is a little bit of an old school term. We now refer to it as covert influence. The other people do propaganda. We do covert influence. Political action is getting involved in the political affairs of a foreign country to help a candidate or degrade a government's legitimacy, things like that. Paramilitary is a very elastic term. It means anything with the potential or actuality for violence and lethality. So it can run the gamut from helping train a security service to conducting or assisting an insurgency. And in a woefully but happily brief period in our history, uh, engaged in assassination plotting. Economic covert action sometimes is more often a part of political action because you engage in things like sabotage, counterfeiting, uh, subverting the supply chain, things like that, not so much for the economic benefits, but to degrade a government's legitimacy and stability. So oftentimes economic is really a subset of political action. Now it's a truism in covert action that it should be most effective if it's part of a whole of government approach. But we do want to make sure we understand that you, even though you have this overlap between the overt and the covert side of U.S. government activity, covert action is not explicitly designed to support any of these activities here. So let's just take one example. We might have a counterterrorism operation going on under covert action authorities. If we find out that something in there is actionable for the FBI, then we will turn that information over to it to engage in law enforcement activities, an arrest and a prosecution. We are not engaging in law enforcement activity directly, even though indirectly we have aided it through a counterterrorism covert action activity. But the general point here I want to make is that <clears throat> the most successful covert actions have been part of a whole of government approach in which the overt and the covert complement one another. One of the reasons why covert action sometimes fails is that they are the overt and the covert sides of the government are working at cross purposes, or the covert action is brought in too late in the overt undertakings to enable it to uh, succeed. Looking back on our broad history, we want to understand some major points. <clears throat> Most people think that the CIA really is the central covert action agency. Um, that's true at times in our history. If you look at our budget, which I can't talk about in specifics here, it's really more like a sine curve. And if you think about a timeline of U.S. history and international history since the Cold War, I think you can see where the peaks and valleys are, where covert action would be more or less engaged, certainly uh, throughout the 50s and into the early 60s. Then it tails off into the 1970s, peaks again in the 1980s, dies again in the 1990s, goes way up after 9-11, and the money and resources follow. If you take a straight line average of the agency's budget, it's a decent amount of money, but it has fluctuated majorly from over 50% in the early 1950s to barely 3% at the doldrums of the late 1970s. As I mentioned, covert action is very controversial because it implements policy, and oftentimes those policies aren't working. Policymakers decide to use covert action as a bailout, a silver bullet, and I don't know what else to do. Let's call the CIA. That's a recipe for disaster. But of course, as we all know, in our environment, uh, intelligence agencies usually take the blame for these things. Uh, the policymakers uh, often get off scot free. And that leads to recriminations and controversies and blowback which was very, very strong in the 1970s when because of a number of covert action exposures, along with other scandals and uh, distortions of what the agency had done, you suddenly have a lot of oversight being weighed in. Previously, Congress didn't want to know much about covert action, but in the 1970s, you have the oversight committees created following from the congressional investigations. And now Congress spends more time looking at CIA's covert action activities than anything else we do. Despite all the controversies and the highlighting of failures, which are uh, well known, 
Covert action can be quite effective when it's employed properly, and I'll give you some guidelines there. But one of the underlying problems here is that covert action is often misunderstood and misused. Policymakers don't appreciate that it takes a lot of time to set up a covert action infrastructure, to recruit assets, to put in the plumbing, as some people have called it. And covert action has to have time to work. You can't suddenly start beaming in covert influence messages and expect people to change their minds overnight. Insurgencies take a while to build. Political parties need time to mobilize. But in the Washington political environment, patience is a precious commodity. As a result, policymakers become very impatient. They expect quick results. Congressionals who are working on a two-year election cycle are often trying to tout foreign policy as a, a part of their platforms, and they're looking for success stories. And this is, as I say, a recipe for failure, and it underlies a number of the more prominent ones. Now, if you look back at our history, and here I'm talking about all of our acknowledged programs, but trust me on this, this pertains also to our unacknowledged programs. I'll get to the acknowledged programs in a little bit. If you look at all of the ones that worked, here are the guidelines, the secrets to success. And some of these are pretty obvious, but what's regrettable is that oftentimes we have violated them in the course of implementing the covert program, not always to our blame, but sometimes to it. As I said, part of an overall strategic approach to foreign policy implemented early, the later you do it, the more likely it's not to have effect, a good effect or possibly uh, deleterious effects. You don't wanna go into a country with a whole lot of people and equipment, if you will, uh, you have to <clears throat> keep the presence covert to provide deniability, <clears throat> and you want your field officers to be able to have flexibility and latitude to adapt to the very changes they're trying to carry out. Oftentimes, those changes occur in slightly different directions, or sometimes they create unexpected circumstances, and field officers need the ability to quickly respond to those instead of waiting for guidance from headquarters. A very important aspect of covert action is to understand that you essentially have to work with what you're given. You have a, a set of cards, so to speak, that you're dealt, and you have to make the best play that you can. You can't create institutions, oppositions, media capabilities in situations and environments where they simply don't exist. You have to work with the existing civic infrastructure, the media infrastructure. You can amplify it, you can supplement it, but essentially, you don't create uh, something out of nothing. You don't make bricks without straw, so to speak. A lot of times, however, some of our policies have had us work on the edges and try to amplify those fringe elements, and that doesn't work out uh, most of the time. Because the change you are trying to affect is supposedly to benefit also the target allies, you want to give them the ability to choose some of the outcomes. You want legitimacy to be built into your program. If it's perceived as being totally manipulated from outside, particularly if you're using expatriates uh, in a regime change operation, you're going to have a lot of trouble making your desired outcome stick, assuming you can even achieve it. The best approach here is to agree with the locals whom you are enabling, they are allies, they are not proxies, and that's an important point. You want to give them a sense of buy-in and independence. But you also have a consensus that within a range of acceptable outcomes, uh, you, the United States, will be satisfied with whatever the locals pick. As an example, let's say you have an election coming up with five political parties, one on the hard right, one on the hard left, a moderate left, a moderate conservative, and a centrist party. You want to exclude the extremes, of course, but you believe that you can live with, the U.S. government can live with, any of the three in the so-called middle. Then you let the locals choose, and it's their choice. You've enabled them to make that choice. It has the legitimacy it needs to uh, endure. And, of course, you need to know the target country, have a lot of good foreign intelligence collection already in place, and protect your program from compromise with good counterintelligence and security. Uh, you don't want it to be blown open right in the middle of what you're trying to accomplish. <clears throat> 
And regrettably, we have had a number of those instances when programs have been penetrated or compromised for one reason or another. The flip side, which I won't spend much time on, is exactly the opposite of what I just said. Uh, if you don't do any of these things, and hopefully all of them, then you have a greater opportunity for success. Note specifically, doesn't fit the target's political culture. You can't create a democracy out of a traditional autocratic environment. Uh, you have to make sure that you are able to build popular support, but if the target government maintains control of the security services, the military, and it has some measure of popular support, you're really pushing a boulder uphill. And policymakers need to recognize that. If they bring in covert action as an attempt to salvage a failing policy, the covert action is also going to fail. As I said, covert action is not a silver bullet or a safety net for bad or badly thought out policies. Now, here's an important point for all of you working in the open source world, uh, scholars, writers, students, whatever. The CIA, for various reasons, uh, legal mandates, uh, internal determinations, uh, decisions that because so much has already been written about the covert action, we might as well acknowledge it, whatever the reason, we have acknowledged I, by my count, roughly 50 covert actions in the major categories, as shown here. These cover the world. They also run the gamut from 1948 to 2011. The last officially acknowledged program was the bin Laden raid. You'll see a whole variety of programs in here, some major ones, some minor ones. I, I suspect a lot of these you've never heard of before. My point here is that these are all acknowledged, which means some degree of documentation, and in some cases, lots of documentation exists in official histories that we've declassified in documentary releases, particularly through the State Department's Foreign Relations of the U.S. series. And in other venues, you can find a lot of information on our Freedom of Information Act uh, website on CIA.gov. And you can use this information for analyses. And at the end of my presentation, I'll show you one analysis that I made, which runs very much contrary to the conventional wisdom about covert action. Covert action is one of the toughest things we do. Now, of course, we don't recruit every agent we pitch, so the failure rate is higher, really, in the espionage business, but that's all pretty quiet stuff. The problem here is that our failures get publicized often. And because over 50% of them do fail, this explains to a large degree the controversiality of covert action. People know about the failures. If you go into most history books and you look in the index under Central Intelligence Agency, if it's there, you'll probably see a whole list of failed covert action operations. And it is a bit of a truism that the successes don't get known about. And the failures become the point of scholarship, the point of debate, and ex help explain why certain misperceptions about covert action arise. Again, I'll mention that toward the end. We're better at the soft stuff, if you will, than the hard stuff. It's hard to keep a paramilitary operation under wraps because when people start shooting others and blowing things up, uh, it makes news. And suddenly people will start asking, well, this wasn't happening a few months ago. What's going on? Usually in that kind of situation, only a couple of external actors have any stake in having that kind of violence erupt. And it's pretty obvious who they are. It's easier to conceal the softer stuff, but it's also harder to gauge the success of them. I mean, it's one thing in an insurgency to say they're killing more of the government forces, they're seizing more property, they're gaining popular support. That can be readily gauged, as in, and most obviously in a regime change operation. Either the regime stays or, or it goes. But when you're talking about political action and propaganda, the measures of effectiveness, as we call them, are a little tougher to gauge. Yes, it's easy to say a party you're supporting won the election. That's cut and dried. But in the propaganda or covert influence area, it's tough, especially now in the social media age, because people have so much access to different kinds of information from so many different sources. It's hard to say that your messages made a difference. And very importantly, is that last point, 
durability of what you have affected. Fewer than 30% of our successes have lasted. And that's where a lot of the controversy comes in. I would argue that many of our so-called failures are actually policy failures, failures to follow up on successful covert action. I'll give you some examples of those when we turn to the case studies. Now, if it's so hard to make covert action succeed, why do we do it? I'll give you a few perspectives here, both pro and con, regarding covert action. Back at the advent of the Cold War, Harry Truman, the president who signed the law that created CIA, sees covert action as essentially a weapon almost of survival. This is a period of time when the fate of the world was at stake. It was a battle between good and evil, the East and the West, or West and the East, more accurately. And anything goes, almost. So for Truman, it was essential to have this weapon really as a tool for national survival. If we think about it uh, with a slightly more cynical edge, and here I like this quote from the figure Control in one of my favorite spy novels, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold, this individual who represents the head of the British Secret Service is saying that we can't surrender the field just because other people are doing occasionally nasty things. Uh, if you go down a dark alley without a knife, you'll probably get what you deserve. You have to weaponize yourself to deal with the adversary who's going to be pretty ruthless and seeks victory over you. You can't go into the boxing match with one hand tied behind your back and hopping around on one foot. You have to have the full arsenal uh, available to you. On the other side, you have people who say, well, if they were doing that to us, we wouldn't like it, so we shouldn't do it to them. Interestingly, this old uh, morality argument came to the fore during the Russian influence operation. Uh, people started to say, and I had some dealings uh, on the internal side with people about this, well, if the Russians are doing it to this and we want to do similar things in other countries, what if it gets exposed? Then people will just say we're no better than the Russians. So this idea, kind of the golden rule approach to covert action, uh, is one that resonates uh, still in American political discourse about covert action. A harder edge comes from people who take a flat out, it's evil, it's wicked, only the innocents get hurt, we should never touch covert action. We have no business as an intelligence agency doing anything but espionage and analysis. Philip Agee, as you're probably well aware, turned out to be a Cuban agent, uh, died in Havana uh, a number of years ago, had an epiphany after working as a case officer in Latin American affairs and suddenly says, uh, it's the nastiest thing we do and we need to completely renounce our capability for doing it. A more reasonable approach looks at covert action strictly from a cost-benefit analysis. This is Arthur Schlesinger, the court historian of the Kennedy administration, writing soon after the Bay of Pigs disaster, but I think he makes some pretty good arguments here. Uh, it's hard to keep it secret. It's hard to deal with the unexpected outcomes. Uh, it's often done without appropriate accountability. And it often doesn't have a whole lot of impact. It's very tough to say, well, because we helped that political party, it got an extra 3% of the vote that enabled it to win the election. And that's a fair argument. We're dealing with the measures of effectiveness constantly. And to some extent, he is correct. Uh, its overall significance in foreign affairs has been somewhat overrated. I wouldn't say greatly, but this, I think, is a quite cogent argument. I, I won't deny its validity. However, getting back to the basics, covert action is the tool of the president uh, when he wants to invoke it. And this somewhat wry comment from one of our former directors suggests a constant element of covert action history. It's often referred to as the third option, the one that you go to when diplomacy isn't working and for whatever reason, you can't call in the Marines or use military force. You have to have that option to work in the covert world to affect foreign policy uh, achievements. And Jimmy Carter was one, as we'll see, who was quite averse to covert action, but 
uh, strangely enough, wound up signing more findings as president than any other. But we'll explain that when we get to it in our uh, case studies. With all that said, I think Richard Helms provides some very good advice. Uh, he was suspicious of covert action. He was a career espionage officer and espionage operations manager. He thought covert action in peacetime was a very dubious enterprise. And he knew, based on his own political knowledge and instincts, that presidents were very likely to overuse it. As he points out here with this very neat metaphor, it really is more of a surgical weapon. You use it to take action against a very specific kind of problem, which isn't to say that we have never done strategic covert actions over the long term. Covert action has been very tactical. We have a specific problem to deal with. We go in and try to do it covertly, and it lasts, it runs for three, four years, and that's it. We have a number of covert actions that are very short duration, but we also have a number that are lengthy and strategically designed. But his basic point here is don't overdo it and don't think that it's an all-purpose tool to be used in any political or diplomatic situation. And a very important point here, which gets to our issue of success and failure. Covert action, if it's properly designed, has a beginning and an end. Now, we all know that the U.S. government is dealing with these perennial multinational or transnational issues like narcotics, trafficking, terrorism, weapons proliferation, those are going to go on forever. We're always going to have people involved in that business. But when we're talking about a covert action that is targeting a particular country, it's best if the finding, the declaration of purpose and the authority from the president to the agency to do covert action, if that is carefully framed with a beginning and an end, and we know what we want success to look like, then the covert action has a lifespan. When the covert action ends, for whatever reason, whether it's succeeded, whether it seems to be uh, ineffective and is terminated, or whether it's overtaken by events and is terminated, at that point, the action shifts, the responsibility shifts from CIA to the foreign policy community. That handoff between covert action and policy is crucial in many of our covert actions. I'll give you a number of examples of so-called failures that I think are much more attributable to policy failure, failure of policy to follow up on the covert action success. As Helm says here, the CIA is not a nation building organization, but you can think right off uh, the top, a number of cases in which CIA has been brought in to do exactly that and not terribly successfully. Instead, that should be the province of State Department, military assistance programs, AID, NGOs, whatever. But that's not intelligence business. And Helms's caveat here, I think, is a crucial one for policymakers and observers of covert action to try to understand. Now we'll shift to a series of case studies <clears throat> that highlight major programs and exemplify or fail to exemplify some of our measures of success. The first one occurs in 1948. It's a big success, though we're still arguing to this very day whether our assistance to the Christian Democrats, the center-right party we were supporting uh, against the communists, which had a lot of backing from the Soviet Union, whether CIA covert action made the difference. We do know the outcome was what we wanted. The Christian Democrats got a sizable majority in parliament, so big that the communists could not claim that it was unlegitimate. And that prevented uh, political instability from ensuing in this key country after uh, World War II. The whole point here was to prevent communism from gaining uh, support. We did not want communism to take power through the political process because we knew any time it had started to do that in Eastern Europe, and we have several examples there during this period, that was the last time you had a political process. Democracy died, uh, as the Washington Post headline likes to say, in darkness at that point. And we wanted to make sure that did not happen. So we engage in a political action program that becomes 
sort of a bag of tricks that we carry around the world with varying measures of success in places where it really was not appropriate. But we learned some important lessons about how to run uh, political action with a combination of other techniques, uh, covert influence, and things that we probably wouldn't be allowed to do today, such as bribery and engaging in Americans uh, helping the program. Those were all uh, made to do in the 1970s. More strategically, we have what we call here the Hearts and Minds campaign, the covert influence campaign that was a uh, full bore, uh, multifaceted effort to counteract Soviet front organizations and propaganda and political efforts to suborn people in Western European countries, particularly the intellectual class, which was somewhat, uh, and in some cases very much, uh, taken with uh, communism as a panacea for the post-war uh, economic and social problems. We didn't want that to spread. And so we create, in effect, a counter uh, program against the things the Soviets were doing. This involved uh, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, the Congress for Cultural Freedom, uh, magazines, books, groups we subsidize, such as uh, National Students Association, uh, women's groups, journalist groups, lawyers groups. We hosted uh, public exhibitions of art. We subsidized concerts by classical orchestras and jazz bands. All of this an effort to tout the value of Western intellectual freedom against the lockstep socialist realism and Marxism of uh, the communist camp. This went on for decades. Uh, I'll show you at a point where we ran into some political problems about it, but we think overall that this proved to be uh, quite effective, and we do consider it a success story for us. A much more mixed picture arises when we move out of the Western European democratic environment into the third world. During the 1950s, as part of an effort to contain and in some cases try to roll back communism, the Eisenhower administration launched a variety of covert action campaigns that had a very mixed record of success. Uh, we're familiar, of course, with the 1953 operation in Iran that enabled the Shah to return and uh, regain the throne. He never really lost it, but um, he had vacated it. Uh, we supported a military coup in Guatemala against a democratically elected uh, left-wing nationalist. Uh, in Indonesia, we tried to get rid of Sukarno, another one of those troublesome left-wing nationalists who were causing so much trouble to us in the 1950s, because though they claimed that they were non-aligned with the Soviet Union or West, they were anything but. They routinely supported Soviet foreign policy. And then, of course, the notorious efforts to get rid of Castro. We also had a variety of operations to support activities uh, in, during the Korean War, uh, some operations in China and elsewhere. All of this a very mixed record because we're dealing with difficult operational environments, not much to work with, uh, strong security services in some cases, uh, questionable allies who weren't able to uh, carry out the ultimate goals of the covert action program, and in some cases, just some very bad missteps in operational planning. Nonetheless, because of the early successes in Iran and Guatemala, the Eisenhower administration, and to some extent the Kennedy administration, continued to think that this was the way to go. And it turned out to be uh, an example of bad learning from history. Well-known intelligence scholar Greg Treverton says this about those early operations in Iran and Guatemala. Small, cheap, fast, tolerably secret, uh, this is the way to go. However, you have to keep in mind the failures at the time. And our former head of analysis, Ray Klein, points out some very uh, important elements of covert action that harking back to some of the things Helm said earlier. Covert action works when you have really an ideal environment where you're able to tip the scales in your favor. Marginal assistance in the right way at the right time, making sure you're using the right mix of operational techniques and the timing is crucial. 
one of the reasons why some of those early failures occurred is that it was the wrong time to use the types of methods that we were trying to carry out. And this is the result. Uh, the Bay of Pigs is still the biggest operational failure in covert action we've ever had. Part of it was because some of the same people who worked on the Guatemala so-called success were involved in this one and tried to do the same things in a quite different operational environment. Other things pertained as well. Uh, it was not well planned. The program was penetrated. It was publicized in the press uh, ahead of time, and it had serious implications for the agency. Uh, our director at the time, Alan Dulles, is dismissed and replaced with John McCone, uh, one of whose missions was to prevent other bays of pigs from occurring. And he clamped down on covert action. He set up some new internal procedures for monitoring it and overseeing it. And very importantly for uh, the longer term, the agency gradually lost its large-scale paramilitary capabilities to the military. In a program called Switchback that took place between 61 and 64 and was focused in Vietnam, the agency's paramilitary activities, which were actually gaining some ground there at the time, were gradually devolved over to the military special forces. And I think it's fair to say we're not carried out uh, with the same measure of success. This isn't to say, of course, that CIA was out of the paramilitary business for good, but running 1,500-man uh, uh, proxy armies in certain countries was not the case. Now, we did do it in Laos, as we'll talk about, and that was kind of the exception that uh, makes the point. And here we have, especially in the, uh, the, the Castro area, uh, sort of an indication of how persistent uh, covert action is in the minds of certain presidents. From every administration, from Eisenhower through Clinton, as these caricatures show, the idea that we could gradually get rid of Castro through overt and covert pressure uh, was uh, really uh, like chasing a unicorn, and we know ultimately that it all failed. For a short, thankfully, period of time, we did get involved in the very uh, questionable area of assassination plotting. And I think it's good that all of these failed. I'm not sure I would have wanted any of these to be uh, on our record uh, over the years. This was the notorious ZR rifle program that began in the late 50s and ended in 1963, targeting uh, mainly these three individuals. And uh, we know when these were exposed in the mid-1970s, it was a disaster. This was the major point of the uh, Church, uh, church committees' uh, initial investigations and caused us all sorts of headaches when they were exposed and tainted for, and along with other failures, the whole enterprise of covert action for a number of years. All that said, we had uh, some very interesting success stories, some that deserve a lot more treatment than they're getting. Uh, thankfully, Max Boot, in his recent biography of Edward Lansdale, talks about the Philippine operation, and I'd like to spend just a couple minutes on it here. It was a good example of how you can mix the soft and the hard programs very successfully in what really was an ideal operational environment. Uh, the concern here was that the Philippines might become unstable because of an, a Maoist insurgency. It was not aided and abetted by outsiders, but it was Maoist inspired, the Hook Balahop uh, rebellion. Lansdale is brought in. He's an advertising executive with military experience, so he kind of covers both sides of the street in covert action. And the whole point is to maintain stability and develop a functioning democratic system. We have also a Pay, uh, a proxy here, which is not really the right word to use for him, but it was at the time, uh, Ramon Magsese, the Minister of Defense. He is a non-corrupt, popular individual, and in the course of s helping suppress the rebellion of the Hooks, uh, we also get behind him as a presidential candidate. With the help of Lansdale and others, the election finally comes off and is very clean by Philippine standards. No vote rigging, no corruption, no bribery, no forcing people to vote or not vote. Uh, and it's set up after he took over as president, 
a functioning democratic system, except for the Marcos interlude uh, in the later 70s and 80s, uh, that persists today with a little bit of concern, of course, because of Duterte. But nonetheless, I think we can tout this as a very good success story that showed you can meld the lethal and non-lethal programs very, very effectively if you have a perceived legitimate uh, supporter inside uh, the country and you enable the people to make their own choice. This one checks a number of the boxes on that list of uh, secrets to success. Now, here's another example, however, of misappropriation of a success. Lansdale is then charged with trying to do the same thing in Vietnam. And there you have a very different operating environment with an entirely different set of political actors, uh, especially the uh, ZM family, which is not perceived as legitimate. And as we'll see, that created a whole slew of problems. The major program we had in the Congo is only recently acknowledged, and we can talk about it in its full form, getting beyond, thankfully, the Lumumba assassination plot, which fixated people's attention for many, many years. The whole point of it here is to take this massive country, this is as big as the eastern United States, and make sure that it doesn't become unstable and ripe for the picking by the Soviets, who certainly were salivating over the prospect, given its strategic location and all of its uh, rich strategic resources. The problem here is that it had, we didn't have anything to work with. The Belgians had been one of the most worst colonialist powers and left no civic infrastructure when they departed rapidly in 1960. So in effect, we are in the nation building business here. We have to try to create a functioning parliamentary democracy where you have nobody with political experience in it. And remarkably, fewer than two dozen college educated individuals in the entire country's leadership. So what do we do? We, in effect, throw money at it. We spent huge amounts of money buying the favor of various political figures to stop fighting amongst themselves and get together and organize a functional government. Along the way, we're also concerned that the country might fall apart. It's one of these numerous countries in the third world that's artificial. It's really four countries, but colonial map makers decided to create it as one. And the country is beset with secessionist movements, particularly in the Katanga province, but also out uh, in the eastern areas. Those were assisted later on by the Chinese and to some extent the Cubans. So we have a, a double problem here. Getting the central government in what was then Leopoldville, now Kinshasa, to function and to work somehow to hold the country together when it doesn't have any military capacity. So the agency is now in the paramilitary business of creating an army and a navy and an air force using mercenaries in large measure from South Africa and Rhodesia to help provide some order, but also our own people uh, in the field, but very few of them. The problem here is that Congo remains a bit unstable for a while, and eventually Joseph Mobutu, the head of the army, who periodically had stepped in to say, boys, let's stop fighting in the sandbox, moves in for good. Now, as I say here in the last uh, tick there, we got what we wanted, a strong central government that could hold the country together, but it came about, in effect, through a peaceful military coup and not through the political process. But for the policymakers at the time, this was acceptable. Uh, regrettably, though, we know what happened later on with Mobutu, a reliable ally, but a horrible uh, leader who eventually ran his country into the ground. This is, however, a perfect example of what I said earlier about the handoff between policy and covert action. CIA pulled out of the country in covert action in 1968. We had accomplished what we were sent in there to do. What happened from 68 to 99 when Mabuto, uh, Mabuto leaves is really a policy issue. As long as he voted with the U.S. and the U.N., was a reliable anti-communist, let us use his country to stage other operations on the continent, all policymakers, both parties, and political inclinations were happy with that. I would attribute then the so-called failure of this to all of that 30 years rather than to the agency's policy itself. I would say the same thing about Iran in 53. 
We were sent in to help the Shah get back into power. We did it. And what happened between 53 and 79 when Khomeini took over is really a policy issue, not an intelligence one. Vietnam is a very complicated story, in part because during the roughly uh, 15 plus years, or almost 20 years, I should say, that we were engaged in covert action there, about every three or four years, the mission changes, and that's no way to run covert action. We start out working with, uh, trying to work with the Saigon government to stabilize it after it takes power in dubious circumstances. Then when the communists start to surge a bit again in the early 60s, we switch to pacification in the South, which works reasonably well as long as it's kept localized, but the Saigon government moved in and took it over. Also by this time, our paramilitary focused activities are shifting over to military special forces. This includes our infiltration operations into the North, which were a disaster whether we were doing them or the military was doing them. Total failure, showing how difficult it is to send people in over the wire into a police security state when you don't have any resistance infrastructure to deal with. This was a very bad misappropriation of the OSS operations in Europe and Southeast Asia, where we did have allies on the ground in the occupied territories. Here in the case of North Vietnam, we simply don't have that. The Phoenix program, which was an effort from 68 to 72 to destroy the Viet Cong infrastructure in the South, was a success. But because of excesses, principally on the part of South Vietnamese allies, it created a backlash when it was exposed and became stigmatized as an assassination program, which it was not. It was successful in destroying uh, the VCI in the South. But all along the way through this history, we're having major problems with counterintelligence as the somewhat unreliable South Vietnamese allies uh, were penetrated. Some of them were doubled. We had a big problem with linguists. We had to rely on local linguists. Often they were either planted or turned back against us. Uh, very, very difficult to maintain uh, the integrity of the programs when you have those kinds of security issues. Right next door, however, we're running a very successful program. And as I said, this is the exception to the large scale paramilitary operations. The point here was to keep Laos, which was declared a neutral country uh, under the Geneva Accords from falling into the control, under the control of the North Vietnamese. So when conventional forces are supposed to pull out of the country under those accords, we do and they don't. And they also had the benefit of a vibrant ally inside Laos called the Pathet Lao, the, the Laotian Communist Party. So the conundrum here for the Kennedy administration is obviously diplomacy is irrelevant and we can't send the military back in. So classically, we have to have the covert action as the third option. So in what turns out to be a very successful and big program, the biggest until Afghanistan, a variety of activities occur here using upwards of 50,000 tribal proxies, allies, particularly the Hmong, but others as well, who did intelligence collection, uh, interdiction of traffic down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, harassment. They served as road watchers, and they also fought with the Path at Lao. All of that put together enabled us to keep the government in Vientiane on our side and out of the hands of the communists. It worked extremely well until we pulled out of there and every place else in Southeast Asia. And then uh, the so-called dominoes uh, began to fall, as you well know. Here's another recently acknowledged program. You probably don't know much about this, but again, as I said earlier, documentation is readily available about it in various sources. And here you have a case in which you can take a European style political action and move it into the third world, because you're talking here about a British colony, formerly called British Guiana. It was slated for independence sometime in the mid 1960s. And what the goal was here, which the British shared with us and assisted us to some extent, was to prevent a leftist or communist party from controlling the government by gaining power through the electoral process. Here you can think we're just transplanting the Italian paradigm uh, over here. What we do then is to take 
very similar techniques from what we used in Italy and France, for example, and use them here. Uh, funding centrist parties, trying to organize a coalition against the left-wing nationalist we were concerned would win the uh, election and uh, lead the country into independence. That person's name was Chetty Jagan. He was an Asian Indian, as many people in British Guiana were. It's a very polyglot, multi-ethnic, diverse country, which gave us an opportunity to try to fracture Jagan's coalition of those groups by using what nowadays would be considered some pretty blatant racist and uh, religious appeals, uh, setting black against white, Hindu against Muslim, uh, Indian against European, etc. It was not necessarily a, a nice sounding program. And as I say, we wouldn't be able to do it these days, but it did work. That and uh, for other reasons, uh, Jagan's coalition started to become unstable. And the opposition leader we were supporting, a guy named Forbes Burnham, working with an ally, was able to assemble a coalition in uh, the 1964 election. Guyana gains independence in 1966, and we're happy. The covert action is over. We have a, an ally in power. And here's a good case of what, where you don't always get what you wish for. Is Forbes Burnham turned out to be one of the most troublesome allies where you can imagine. Despite the fact that British Guiana was getting more per capita foreign aid than any other country uh, in, the Latin, in Latin America from the United States, Forbes Burnham decides to do exactly the opposite of what we hoped. He cozies up to the Soviets, the Chinese, the North Koreans, for crying out loud, and we just have a heck of a time dealing with him for the next several years and eventually cut all ties with him and let him go uh, his own way. Uh, a good example of covert action success, but lots of unintended consequences following on, ones that the policymakers really couldn't do anything about. Here's one of our most notorious ones. It's sort of the covert action disaster that keeps on giving, regrettably. This is one more than any other tainted covert action as being undemocratic, in part because unlike the other covert actions, this one developed a political constituency around it, a group of human rights activists, social justice uh, advocates, uh, mostly on the left, people who were thinking that the failure of Salvador Allende, the socialist, to keep in power was a great lost opportunity for a peaceful transition into a socialist paradise there. All of that uh, is one of the reasons why this program remains so controversial, because it has uh, publicity momentum behind it by these scholars and activists uh, whom I mentioned. But let's talk about the program itself. This wasn't the first time CIA got involved in Chilean politics. It started way back in 58 when Chile had a presidential election. Six years later, it had another one. Its constitution has mandates a six-year election cycle. In both of those cases, Salvador Allende, the guy on the right with his hand up, uh, is the lead socialist candidate. Uh, he loses both times, in part because of uh, CIA intervention on behalf of the center-right candidate. In 1970, he's back at it. Now, this time, he seems to have a good opportunity to win. He's getting a lot of money from the Soviets and the Cubans that he hadn't gotten before. And because he had pledged very clearly that he was going to nationalize a number of big U.S.-based corporations like Anaconda Copper and International Telephone and Telegraph, this put a scare in the Nixon administration. However, the scare came too late. Uh, it's pretty clear that sometime in June or July, the Nixon administration wakes up and starts being concerned about Chile. But as we talked about, this is way too late in the trajectory of events down there to have a whole lot of effect. But that didn't stop the Nixon administration from trying to prevent Allende from winning the next election. Now, in the Chilean constitution, you have a, in effect, a two-part election process. If a presidential a set of presidential candidates don't get a majority in the first round, it then goes into the legislature, which chooses from the top two uh, vote getters. 
Allende won, but only by a plurality in September. And at this point, the Nixon administration really gets scared and calls in the CIA and tells it to prevent Allende from winning. Now, here are two big problems. One, it's September. The next round is in November. Six weeks to make this happen. Secondly, the CIA did not have an extensive covert action infrastructure in Chile at the time. We had assets in the media and in the political parties, but we did not have a boisterous covert action capability. You can't build this in six weeks. Third problem is that the more notorious part of the program, uh, track two, is done completely uh, on the QT. In effect, Nixon, Kissinger, and Helms cook it up, or rather I should say Nixon and Kissinger cook it up and tell Helms to carry it out. In extremis, if it seems like Allende is going to win, we are to organize a coup plot involving dissident military officers. Overall, you can see the problem here, not just lack of time, but the fact that we have no positive program. We are not supporting Allende's main opponent. We are just trying to keep him out of power in a spoiling operation. And as a result, uh, we simply don't have the time to make any of this happen, and we don't have a positive program. We don't have allies, really, to assist us. This is a bad way to run a program. Covert action should always have a shared goal with your allies in country. The result of this, and lots of details are available in the public record, is that Allende wins the second phase of the election. Along the way, a uh, disaster occurs in which uh, an attempt to kidnap the, in effect, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the Chilean military goes awry, and he winds up getting shot and dying later. Uh, it, it's a total disaster. Allende wins, takes power. We stay down doing some covert action during those intervening three years. The government becomes increasingly unstable, largely because of Allende's mishandling of the economy. And it, the press builds and builds. And finally, the military says enough's enough. We're taking over. And this is the coup in which Allende kills himself. People, Some people still believe he was assassinated. Some people still believe the CIA was behind all of this. Uh, no to both. But this becomes one of the hallmarks of CIA's counterintelligence history is that we are, it is fundamentally undemocratic. When all of this blows up in the 1970s because of exposures and compromises, you have some important effects that persist to this day. Uh, no longer can we do political assassination. Now, targeted killings for counterterrorism reasons is another point. We'll get into that now, but a political assassination either by an American operative or a, a foreign operative, are banned. The oversight committees are instituted, and as I said earlier, they spend more time looking at covert action than anything else. The president can no longer hide behind plausible deniability. He must sign a piece of paper that authorizes the program and explains what it's about. Congress has to be fully and currently informed. That's worked out over time to be within a, a couple of days. And who gets informed is up to the president, whether it's the, all the committees, the leadership of the both chambers, the so-called Gang of Eight, uh, that's up to him. And importantly, covert action activities are cut way back to the smallest percentage of our budget ever. As part of this upheaval uh, of the 1970s, you have the Carter administration coming in <clears throat> with a lot of suspicion about intelligence and covert action. And a preference very much for using clean espionage through satellites and technology rather than that dirty stuff of uh, recruiting people, and especially very suspicious of covert action because of all the political problems surrounding it. That said, two things happen that change uh, the world at the time for the Carter administration. The Sandinista take over Nicaragua and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. <clears throat> I think you'd be interested to know that Carter signed all of the findings for Afghan covert action that the Reagan administration later used so effectively. And it signed, he signed two of the findings for Nicaragua, the non lethal ones that the Reagan administration expanded on when it was supporting the Contras during the 1980s. 
And as I said, overall, Carter signed more findings than any other president, including Ronald Reagan. What's interesting, though, is he signed most of them toward the end of his administration, and many of them are very, very focused on tactical uh, strategic, tra tactical programs and not in anything longer term. And covert action spending goes up. During the Reagan administration, though, that the two programs really take off and eventually cost uh, major money. Uh, the figure I have here, $600 million, uh, is really only a portion of it. The overall cost of the program was $5 billion. Uh, the Saudis chipped in half of that in a kind of a NPR-style dollar-for-dollar match. This worked, especially the bringing in of the Stingers, uh, very, very important in shifting uh, the momentum on the battlefield. And this also served to discredit the Gorbachev government, which was having all sorts of problems anyway. But when the body bags started coming back and the human rights violations and the atrocities became publicized, it's bad news for Gorbachev and helps undermine uh, any political support that uh, he had there. In Nicaragua, we also have a success. And the point I want to make here is that the Iran-Contra scandal was a sideshow an illegal operation cooked up by the national security staff in the White House and a handful of agency officers who later paid some price for it. But that is not the story behind Nicaragua. The story behind Nicaragua, as you can see from the uh, kind of humorous button that Reagan is holding there, was to roll back communism in Central America. And he was doing the same in some other parts of the region too, notably El Salvador, about which we have acknowledge very little. This became controversial because Congress did not like it. Unlike Afghanistan, which it fully supported, a lot of important people in Congress had big concerns that we were trying to overthrow the Sandinista government, and eventually they cut off the money for it. Now, this is bad for covert action when you have funding taps going on and off and on and off over the course of the program. But despite those problems, uh, two things happened. One was the administration was able to maintain the Contra force, the paramilitary opposition in the field over the years. And when the funding came back on in 86, that paramilitary force was able to achieve a stalemate with the Sandinista military, so much so that they felt that they had to sue for peace. Meanwhile, the Reagan administration is developing the political Contras as an alternative government. They're gaining popular support. And when the Sandinistas finally said, we'll hold an election, which we thought they would corrupt, but didn't, they lose it. To everybody's surprise. And Violetta Chamorro, the widow of a deceased Contra, winds up becoming president. So this is a major covert action success. We turned an authoritarian Marxist government out and got a functioning democratic government in. In a kind of strange replay, perhaps, of the Forbes Burnham business in British Guiana, though, our system worked so well that Daniel Ortega, the head of the Sandinistas, was able to win the election uh, back about 10 years ago. And he's increasingly become more authoritarian, but we have no brief to go down there and change that. Uh, again, a long-term unintended consequence of a covert action success. Now, let me finish up with an important point. First, I want to say this is the kind of examination you can make of all of those acknowledged covert actions. This is only one cut on them. You can think of all sorts of other things that you could do in a, in a scholarly sort of way. My point here is to confront the idea that covert action is undemocratic that in effect, we never saw a right-wing dictator or a multinational corporation that we didn't want to protect. And here you have two statements that are polar opposites. According to Kissinger, covert action generally has been pro-democratic. According to Philip Agee, it's the worst thing we can do. Now, these two can't both be right. You can't synthesize these like uh, in a chemical experiment. So what does the empirical data say? Now, here's what I would suggest you do, and here's what I did. I created a spectrum. On one side of the spectrum, you have themes that are, I think, 
unarguably clearly pro-democratic. If the purpose of your program is to accomplish any of these three things, you can clearly say that you are championing democracy. Get out a dictator, replace it with democratic elements. Inside a dictatorship, promote democratic elements. Or if you have a functioning democracy, prevent it from being subverted by undemocratic elements. This is all pretty cut and dried. And wouldn't it be nice if this is what we would always confront as we moved around the globe? However, in many countries outside the Western ambit, you're dealing with less democratic environments. You're dealing with people who have a more authoritarian political tradition. You're dealing with social groups, religious, tribal groups that practice certain cultural yeah, institutions that don't really fit our model. They may discriminate against people. They may treat people uh, unpleasantly. But the point here is that in the Cold War environment, the alternative of having that country taken over by a communist totalitarian regime was something we couldn't tolerate. Consequently, we wind up working with people who are not necessarily democratic in the sense that we are, but our main goal was to enable them to remain independent, autonomous, to have popular sovereignty, local self-rule, and not have to kowtow to the dictatorship in Moscow or Beijing. So what we do here is promote allies who are willing to work with us to prevent that from happening or to throw out the occupiers. And you can immediately think of numerous examples, and I'll give you some concrete ones uh, in a minute. Key point here is that these people might not be Western-style Democrats, but they're better than being tools of Moscow or Beijing. And then we have in the third category, the least pro-democratic, or to state it more precisely, undemocratic or anti-democratic. You have an elected leader and you engage in political activity to get rid of them because you don't like the outcome of the election. Or you have an elected leader and you do whatever you need to to get that person out, including possibly assassinate or foment a military coup. Uh, this is pretty undemocratic by most guidelines. Begging the question, perhaps in the first part, as we pointed out in some earlier cases, if the election is won by someone else, Will that be the last election you have in that country? So you might put an asterisk next to the political action element here in the, in the first category. But I don't think certainly in the second one where you're talking about violence to overthrow a government, that would be considered uh, pro-democratic. Now, what does the data say? Here, I think we can say, contrary to almost all popular perceptions of covert action, that most of the time we have gone in to accomplish the first two objectives, to either engage in very clearly pro-democratic behavior or to help a country from falling under the sway of a totalitarian power. A number of these won't be well known to you. Some of the programs were very brief. Some of them didn't really accomplish much, but the point is the motivation, the why of why we got involved. And here you have some very significant ones. Uh, Italy, France, uh, the front organizations, the Philippines, uh, the um, other places here, some mixed measures of success, some of them not successful at all. But again, keep in mind uh, the motivation. And you can also see a variety of those in that middle category, that one where we're dealing with people who, if you will, aren't quite like us, uh, Tibet, Laos, uh, Angola, um, Afghanistan, and so forth. But as I say, the point was, let them decide how they want to live their lives. Longer term successes, far fewer of them. A lot of failures have to do with the policy handoff, as I'd mentioned. But even here, we find most of our long term successes are pro-democratic. Uh, regrettably, two prominent ones, Guatemala and Congo, uh, were not. But I say that I think has to do more with the policy issue. Here are the bad ones, the ones that get excessive publicity, the ones that you will find in the indices of those textbooks and history books that I mentioned that talk about covert action. But I would point out one important thing here. Most of those occurred during the early Cold War. 
when that notion of the survival of Western democracy, of the battle of good and evil, was the most prominent in the Cold War era. The last time we engaged in an overtly undemocratic covert action was in Chile, and that was 1970. Without going into any detail whatsoever, I would strongly argue that almost every covert action we have conducted since in these latter years, post-Cold War, fall into the democratic category. The problem is I can't talk about them here. I would, would hope a number of them could be acknowledged in the coming years. But again, this is a kind of a trust me affair. Uh, what I've seen on the inside is even more positive than uh, what is on the outside. Now, here's the, my final point. Um, why do we think covert action is undemocratic? Well, partly because a lot of people don't know a lot about it, and they keep focusing on the same old stories that came out during the church committee hearings and in subsequent uh, disclosures. But I also think it has something to do with the impact of the programs. And here I want to talk about impact in a couple of ways. One is the geopolitical impact. How much did the program change the world, or at least the region, for the long term. Secondly, what kind of political impact did it have when it was disclosed? Was it positive, as in, that was great that you did that, that's what CIA and the U.S. government should be supporting, or was it, that was nasty, you shouldn't be doing that? And here you can see from the proportions a change. Whereas roughly seven out of eight of our programs across the board were pro-democratic in those two first categories I'd mentioned. Here, barely three quarters of the high impact ones are, the ones people know about, the ones you'll find in the literature. And conversely, whereas roughly one out of eight fall in the clearly undemocratic camp across the board, almost a quarter of the ones that people continually recur to when they discuss covert action were less or least democratic. I think this might explain, and I certainly would invite other analyses based on the programs you can find information on, I would argue that this has something to do with the disconnect between the reality and the perception. This is one reason why we need to get out more of our history, disclose more of our programs, and make the point not to propagandize, but to set the historical record straight that covert action is a good thing for the agency to be doing, a good thing for the U.S. government to have at the ready and not the undemocratic, wicked programs that are too often what people discuss uh, when they bother to discuss uh, covert action. Well, that concludes my remarks. And um, I hope I've given you some food for thought. And I certainly invite you to look at all of those other programs that I've mentioned and find out more and do your own analyses. If you're involved with uh, education or you are a champion of U.S. intelligence, uh, take that material and run with it because I think you can pull a lot of valuable lessons out of it and create a broader uh, fact base for the public. So thank you very much for listening and I look forward to uh, seeing you again in future. I'd like to underscore one of the points that uh, David made during his uh, presentation, and that is the degree of oversight that covert action programs um, are exposed to. As some of our viewers um, may know, uh, it was my privilege to serve as the chief of CIA's Near East and South Asia Division for about three years in the late 90s and early 2000s. And one of my responsibilities during that time was to appear at least quarterly before both the Senate and the House um, Intelligence Oversight Committees uh, to brief them in closed session on our covert action programs. Without going into a lot of detail, I can tell you that it was very rigorous. And this is in addition to the ongoing oversight that we had from uh, the executive, primarily from the national security staff uh, on pretty much a weekly, uh, on sometimes daily basis. I want to thank David um, Robarsh 
and the Center for Studies and Intelligence for this um, very informative and educational session. Uh, and David, we look forward to having you back again sometime soon. Thank you, Jim.